Today on another Playback of this podcast is prohibited. Discard your download immediately. Playback this of this podcast is This episode is so is scary that no Discard podcast player will allow it. Instead, Playback we bring you a review of an episode of the Emperor's New School. There is nothing wrong with your podcast machine. Do not attempt to adjust your volume. We are controlling the transmission. What do you mean we're in control? Hey, look! I can see my voice! (laughs) This is my voice on YouTube! Reporter, you're ruining the mood! Sorry. For the next hour, we will control what you see and hear. You are about to experience the terror and foul horror of the Danville Discussion. Hello, mortals, and welcome to a spooktacular episode of the Danville Discussion, a podcast about all things related to Phineas and Ferb and beyond. The podcast that I must warn you all, it may disturb you, it may shock you, it may even horrify you! <laughs> You've been warned. Anyways, I'm your host, Caleb Dirksen, and some of you may know me from my YouTube channel of the same name, the one and only place for some web series related to animation such as Caleb Reviews. If this is your first time listening to the Danville discussion, well, the title should be enough to explain everything for you. It is a podcast that talks about shows set in the universe of Dan Povemeyer and Jeff Swampy Marsh, aka the Dwampyverse. Namely, going through each episode of either Phineas and Ferb or Hamster and Gretel, and uncovering all the cultural or in-universe references, some fun facts, gags, and whatever else might pop up. And then finally, I will end things off by giving each episode a roller coaster rating. For example, on today's episode, since this is a Halloween special, I might as well take a break from reviewing Hamster and Gretel for right now and go further into Season 1 of Phineas and Ferb, where I'm going to be discussing about Episode 22 of that show, which has the spooky segment as well as the not-so-spooky segment, The Monster of Phineas and Ferbenstein, and Oil on Candace. If you want to check out more episodes of the Danville discussion, then log on to anchor.fm slash caleb dirksen and then it'll take you directly to the Danville Discussion website on Anchor, which is now part of Spotify for Podcasters. You can also share your feedback or ask some questions you may have about this episode by emailing us at danvilldiscussion at gmail.com with the series and episode title in the subject line. Now, as we begin, let's find out when these segments first premiered. So, both segments first premiered on Disney Channel on Friday, October 17th, 2008, and they are the 40th and 41st episodes in broadcast order, respectively. So, going into our first segment, it's going to be regarding the main reason why this is a Halloween special, and that is The Monster of Phineas and Furbenstein. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We thought it only fair to warn you that the show you're about to see may disturb you. It may shock you. It may even horrify you. You've been warned. And The Monster of Phineas and Furbenstein was a story by John Colton Berry and Martin Olsen. It was written and storyboarded by John Colton Berry and Michael Diedrich. And it was directed by Zach Moncrief. It opens with Phineas and Ferb on stage in tuxedos, and Phineas warns the viewers that the following story may scare or even horrify them, to which Ferb follows by spewing a hairball. You've been warned, Phineas finishes, before a giant title card appears on screen. 
Now with rain pouring down in front of the Flynn Fletcher house, Phineas is downtrodden and tells Ferb that they can't do their plan to stand alone in a field with a metal pole, which is a cultural reference to Benjamin Franklin with the lightning rod. Sitting back down, Phineas queries where Perry is, and it cuts to him in his lair with Major Monogram appearing in the same fashion as the boys did in the beginning. Monogram tells him that this mission may terrify him, but it probably won't since he's been doing this for a while, and he then explains that the tarp behind him is because of water damage, and then he worries about the time rushing to go to his cousin's wedding after telling Perry to stop Doofenshmirtz. Good morning, Agent P. The mission you're about to receive may shock you. It may even horrify you. But then again, probably not. I mean, you have been doing this for a while. Anyway... Sorry about the tarp behind me. Storm caused some water damage and- Oh, cheese and crackers! Late for my cousin's wedding. Gotta run. Doofenshmirtz is up to something. You know what to do. Back at the Flynn Fletcher house, Grandpa Reginald gets reminded of the story of Ferb's ancestor, Ferbgore. It cuts to a flashback, a grey-tinted Victorian age village where Ferbgore and Dr. Phineas Stein collect a spare part from a semi-aquatic mammal. Then they spot a poster for the best monster contest, and Phineas Stein knows what they're gonna do today. Heading back to the castle, Canis asks if the story could be in color, to which Phineas adds perhaps muted color would be better. Reginald says who's telling this story and then gets back to it, and he then shows us Candace's ancestor, Constance, their disapproving castle governess who is writing with her quill. She then yells at them to keep it down, and then the boys hide after bringing a giant platypus monster to life. After laughing maniacally, Phineas Stein notes that it's really big. It's alive! Alive! <laughs> and it's really big. How big, Grandpa? Bigger than a refrigerator, but smaller than a really big refrigerator. Present day Phineas asks Reg how big, to which he responds by saying bigger than a refrigerator, but smaller than a really big refrigerator. Also in the present, Perry enters the door at Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated, but is yelled at by Dr. Doofenshmirtz to keep it open. It's too late, so Doof tells him how the storm made his security system go haywire. To pass the time, he tells Perry the story of his ancestor, Jekyll Doofenshmirtz. In the flashback, which looks exactly like Reg's and is in the same place and time, Dr. Jekyll Doofenshmirtz is working on a machine when his butler, Jameson, tells him the angry mob is here, since Heinz explained that to be truly evil back then, you had to have your own angry mob after you. Since it's early, the mob must sit in the lounge. After a little while, Jekyll comes up to them and shows them his newest invention, the Concoction Bruinator, and he uses it to create a cup of some liquid and then drinks it. To his surprise, instead of a giant evil monster, he becomes a small fairy princess. He tries to get them to stay, but they leave anyway, laughing. Back with Reg's story, he goes on to explain that the boys were preparing the monster for the big night. Phineas Stein demonstrates to Ferbgore that he taught him to play dead, and Constance storms down after having enough of the noise. Phineas Stein explains that they're entering the monster contest, and Constance says they don't even have a monster. The monster then chatters behind her, and she screams and tells them that she's telling Mob, which is a rather unique twist on the present day telling Mom. What's going on down there? I will go straight to the angry Mob and tell on you. Aha! Oh, hi Constance. We're gonna enter the best monster contest. How are you gonna enter a monster contest? You don't even have a monster! <laughs> He's right behind me, isn't he? Yeah. I'm telling Mob. She bicycles down to the mob and tells them that the boys have made a monster. 
Back in Doofenshmirtz's story, Jekyll Doofenshmirtz explains to Jameson that the reason he turned into the fairy princess is because he accidentally had it on that dial. He fishes it and drinks the right one, becoming a giant hide like monster. He then goes on an evil rampage around the village. At the end of it, he storms over to the boy's castle, actually getting the nose of the platypus monster, who chases after him angrily. The boys must go after him and get him back. The monster chases him all through the village as the boys look in places like a cave. The monster comes over to an Isabella lookalike, while Constance tries to get the mob to go to the monster contest where she's sure the boys are. The boys run into the Isabella lookalike who tells them the monster was at the monster contest. The boys then go to the contest. At the contest, Jekyll plans to win the contest and knock several drinks off a table to place his innator, but unfortunately, the drinks splash all over the monster and the monster starts pounding him violently. He asks for a drink before continuing and drinks from his innator thinking it'll turn into a monster, only to find that he said it to Fairy Princess again, so he corrects the setting right before being grabbed by the monster. Back in the present, Doof tells Perry he forgets what happens after that, just as the lights come back on. He then tells him that he doesn't have time to do his evil scheme right now, as he has a chiropractor's appointment, and suggests doing it tomorrow. In the past, Phineas Stein and Ferbgore have found the monster at the contest who coughs up a wand just in time for the winner to be announced. The winner is Constance, who has just turned into a hide-like monster after accidentally drinking the brew. Phineas Stein tells the Isabella lookalike that they're never going to lose the monster again, and Reginald ends the story by saying, and that is why there are pumpkins. Confused, Phineas tells him he was just telling them a giant platypus monster story, to which Reg says that sounds like a good story. Phineas sighs, and as the lights turn on, he asks Ferb if he has anything to say, and the latter responds with, platypus monsters are the only monsters to lay eggs, and that concludes the monster of Phineas and Ferbenstein. And that is why there are pumpkins. Um, Grandpa, you were telling us about a giant platypus monster. Oh, that sounds very exciting. Tell me about that. But you were, I mean, I didn't. <sighs> I got nothing. Ferb? Platypus monsters are the only monsters to lay eggs. The other cultural references that I found begin with the fact that it parodies several classic monster movies including the ones based on the books Frankenstein and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. For Frankenstein, the entire story of Phineas Stein and Ferb Gore is a parody of Frankenstein, including the title. Also, the introduction to the episode is a direct parody of the introduction of the 1931 Universal film, and the idea of Grandpa Reg telling the tale because they were trapped in the night during a rainstorm is a parody of the real origin of Frankenstein. And then for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the whole story that Doofenshmirtz tells is a parody of the famous story of Jekyll and Hyde, including his ancestor's name, Jekyll Doofenshmirtz. There is also the opening where Phineas and Ferb are on the stage in front of a red curtain with a spotlight shining onto them. Phineas says that this is a horror-themed episode, introducing it in the style of Alfred Hitchcock. This is also near identical to the presentation before some of the earliest Treehouse of Horror episodes from The Simpsons, specifically the first three and Treehouse of Horror 5, including the dialogue warning the viewers about how scary the show in question might be. In fact, as you may have seen or heard at the beginning, I opened this episode in a similar way to Treehouse of Horror 5 when the scene of Marge on the stage goes to a brief few seconds of the fictional Glenn Ford movie 200 Miles to Oregon, and then the TV static cuts to a green radio wave and Bart makes the introduction while Homer has fun with his voice being displayed on screen. Treehouse of Horror 5, by the way, has to be my favorite out of all the Simpsons Treehouse of Horror episodes 
episodes for having some of the funniest moments of the show, including in The Shining, which is a parody of The Shining, with the no TV and no beer make Homer go crazy scene, which has some of Dan Castellaneta's best acting as Homer Simpson, and the part where Homer parodies the Here's Johnny scene from the movie with the axe until he finds his family. David, I'm Grandpa. Do! Oh! I'm Mike Wallace, I'm Marley Schaefer, and I'm Ed Bradley. All this and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes! <laughs> The title card is also a parody of Young Frankenstein, with the text in green in front of the dark castle, and even the dramatic music is similar. Well, there it is. Home. And the spelling of the title could also be a reference to the character Dr. Frankenfurter from both the play and the movie of the Rocky Horror Picture Show created by Richard O'Brien, Lawrence's voice actor. Grandpa Reg paraphrases W.C. Fields from the movie The Fatal Glass of Beer as he reads the newspaper saying, The weather isn't fit for man nor platypus. The sound that the platypus monster makes is similar to Plasmus, a monster villain from the show Teen Titans, and I'm talking about the 2003 series, not the infamous spin-off Teen Titans Go. And this is because both are voiced by Dee Bradley Baker. <laughs> I discovered that one of the monsters attending the contest bears a striking resemblance to Jack Skellington in a scarecrow costume with the pumpkin head from the opening scene of The Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, the opening number This Is Halloween, and the female singers that appear during He's Eviler are reminiscent of the famous close harmony group The Andrews Sisters. I personally know The Andrews Sisters more for their contributions to the classic Disney package films Make My Music and Melody Time, where they sang the songs for their respective segments, Johnny Fedora and Alice Blue Bonnet for Make My Music, and Little Toot for Melody Time. He's public enemy number one, he's an evil, evil man. That's me! He's got a diabolical sense of fun, and an evil, evil plan. We're not a plan so much. Eviler. I'm winning it, actually. More evil than he was before. That's right. Yes, he's evil. I don't think that's a word! Whoops, gotta go! For a fun fact about these singers, since the actual Andrews sisters all stopped doing music together after Laverne Andrews passed away in 1967, followed by Maxine Andrews passing in 1995, with the only remaining member Patricia Andrews still alive at the time of this episode until her passing five years later, Olivia Olsen, who voices Vanessa Doofenshmirtz, overdubbed the singing parts for all three girls to sound like the late Andrews. Andrew sisters of the 1940s. And speaking of fun facts, here's some more handy tools out of my big toolbox of Monster of Phineas and Furbenstein supplies. Isabella, Jeremy, and Roger aren't seen in the episode, but their past lookalikes are seen in the backstory. For example, Dr. Jekyll Doofenshmirtz's butler, Jameson, bears a more striking resemblance to Heinz Doofenshmirtz's brother, Roger. But while several of the characters in the flashback look exactly alike to the characters that appear in the show, only Fergor and Jekyll are said to be related to them. Linda and Lawrence do not appear in this episode. Ferb's line is a parody of what he first said in the series back in Roller Coaster, since he said platypus monsters are the only monsters to lay eggs. Also, Constance's words written in the quill are what her counterpart Candace said in Roller Coaster and The Magnificent Few. The line she yells at the boys is also from Roller Coaster, in which she says, Will you hold it down? I am trying to use the quill. Because telephones and cell phones didn't exist in the time of this episode's setting. So anyway, Jeremiah was like totally checking me out when, Will you hold it down? I am trying to use the quill! 
when the platypus monster walks into the best monster contest, among the crowd standing around is the giant floating baby head that appears in One Good Scare Ought to Do It, It's a Mud 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 World, Out of Tune, and other episodes. This episode is titled How to Make a Monster in the UK, according to the UK TV Guide. The episode appears to take place immediately after or the day after the events of the Flying Fishmonger, as it rains at the end of the latter episode. Jeff Bennett voices the vampire host, as obvious from his Kids WB announcer voice and his bold British accent that he's known to use on some of his European characters, like Lord Bravery from Freakazoid. Ladies and gentlemen! We're ready to announce the winner of the Best Monster Contest! Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the Best Monster Contest is... That! Way to go, Constance! Good show! And Isabella's lookalike claims that she had a PB&J on whole wheat with the platypus monster. However, peanuts are not indigenous to Europe, let alone Drusilstein. Peanuts were also primarily food for livestock until the 1930s. Though this could be for comic relief and because Grandpa Reginald is telling the story, enabling him to make a couple of errors for artistic license. This marks the third appearance of Grandpa and Grandma Fletcher after The Flying Fishmonger and A Hard Day's Night, the second Halloween episode after One Good Scare Ought to Do It, the first episode to have a different stylized title card, the fourth episode in which Perry doesn't battle Dr. Doofenshmirtz following Get That Bigfoot Out of My Face, Traffic Cam Caper, and Put That Putter Away, and one of a few episodes to not end on a guitar strike. And now for the rest of the stuff that I liked or whatever. First off, I like that it is a good parody of monster movies as it pays homage to Young Frankenstein and Jekyll and Hyde, even the introduction parody of Alfred Hitchcock Presents and the early Treehouse of Horror episodes with Phineas and Ferb was hilarious, followed by the Young Frankenstein title card parody. The fact that the former is even repeated for the major monogram briefing is very nice, too. I also liked when Grandpa Red starts talking about Ferb's great 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 uncle before the power goes out in the storm and Candace responds great to the latter event. Lost your platypus, eh? That reminds me of a really great monster story. Tell us, Grandpa. It's about Ferb's ancestor. He was his great 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 uncle. Great. As well as another highlight I have, which is the fourth wall gag in which the characters ask for the story to be in color, and then muted color instead of black and white. Back at Castle Finistein, the boys began building their monster. Can you at least tell a story in color, Grandpa? Perhaps muted color would be better. Who's telling this story anyway? Another good thing about it to me is when Constance says her twist on present Candace's line from Roller Coaster when she's calling Stacy, where instead of a cell phone to message Stacy's ancestor, she's using a quill, which was a type of pen used in the past where you would dunk the stem of a feather into the ink and then write with it. I kind of chuckled at the joke where Phineas Stein typically says, It's alive! and laughs maniacally, and when the platypus monster wakes up, he reacts surprisingly to it with, And it's really big, and back in the present, Phineas asks how big, and Rez compares it to different sized refrigerators, saying it's bigger than a refrigerator but smaller than a really big refrigerator. When we would get to the Doofenshmirtz subplot, I found that Doof's dad telling him the story of Jekyll as a prank to scare him into wetting the bed admittedly was one of the more tolerable things Doof's parents used to do to him, but that doesn't excuse how bad their parenting is in general because that's what forced him to move to America and do his usual evil attempts. Like, I still despise the way his parents treated Doof in his backstories and he really deserves better. Of course, the Jekyll Doofenshmirtz side of the story was fantastic, and I just love Dr. Jekyll's various accidental transformations into a fairy princess instead of a monster. Plus, Jekyll's monster transformation reminds me of Quasimodo from Disney's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And the song He's Evil is a nice parody of the classic 50s doo-wop songs, and a good homage to the Andrews sisters. 
When the episode ended, I loved when Red said, and that is why there are pumpkins, because of course it is an annual tradition to have pumpkins as jack-o'-lanterns, as well as costumes for Halloween, the spooky season. It's been a thing since the 17th century in Salem, Massachusetts. The animation for this was done by Rough Draft Korea, and it looks good for the vast majority of it. I love how expressive the movements and faces are, especially in the opening when Phineas shakes in a macabre way and Ferb spits the hairball. It had excellent visual effects such as electricity, rain, silhouettes, fire, shading, lighting, and the eyes in the dark, as well as the grayscale and muted color effects, and some smooth movements at times where the characters move at 24 frames per second. I like the cartooniness in the part where the platypus monster beats up Jekyll and all the other monsters beat each other up at the best monster contest, and the Isabella lookalike's monster costume made her look kind of beautiful in my opinion. But the visuals aren't without a few flaws still, and there are only three that I have. Right before Grandpa Red says this weather isn't fit for man nor platypus, Candace briefly has four arms, two by her side and two on the back of Ferb's chair, and two torsos, one leading to nothing, and that could have easily been fixed. When Constance drinks the potion, her clothes grow with her as opposed to ripping like with Dr. Jekyll doofenshmirtz, and when Constance screams as the angry mob is chasing her in her monster form, her teeth are still clenched together. For some goofs and errors I don't necessarily have an issue with, when Dr. Jekyll Doofenshmirtz drinks the potion at the monster's ball, the concoction Bruinator has two dials, one pointing to the evil monster and one pointing to the fairy princess. When Jekyll becomes a fairy princess, the angry mob walks out of the room and one of them closes the door, but the light patch on the floor in the shape of the open door remains even when the door is closed. Jekyll, in the fairy princess form, drops his wand when the platypus monster grabs him, but after the platypus monster eats him, he coughs out the wand. Jekyll, however, could have grabbed the wand off screen as a last-ditch effort to escape the monster. When Jekyll knocks on Phineas Stein and Fergor's door, and the platypus monster opens the door, the shadow of the monster cannot be seen on the ground, but when Jekyll runs away, the shadow of the platypus monster can be seen. And in some scenes, Phineas Stein has bags under his eyes, and in others he does not. This was overall a really good Halloween episode in the same veins of One Good Scare Ought to Do It, and I'm gonna watch this every Halloween when I have the chance. Now, our next segment that we have here is Oil on Candace. And Oil on Candace was a story by Bobby Gaylor and Martin Olsen. It was written and storyboarded by Antoine Gilbeau and Aliki Fiofilopoulos, and it was directed by Zach Moncrief. In this one, the Flynn Fletcher family is going with Django Brown at the Jefferson County Museum of Contemporary Art, featuring an exhibit by Django's dad, Beppo Brown, an exhibit which consists of a series of everyday objects but large scale. Let's continue our tour! Over here, we have the work of the great environmental installation artist, Beppo Brown. That's my dad. As Django can tell you, his father Beppo is famous for his monumentalist recreations of everyday objects. Wow, Django. It's so cool that your dad makes such huge things. Look at that giant toothbrush and that giant dental floss. It's even been used. Whoa. And how about that giant baby? My dad didn't make that. Django, isn't that your dad over there? Yeah. I'm going to go say hi. Django spots his dad and runs over to him, asking him if he wants to hang out with them. Beppo is too busy answering questions to the media and others to hang out with his son, but promises to catch up with him later. The kids go to see Beppo's latest exhibit while Candace complains that she would rather be home with Perry. Linda wonders what Perry does when they leave him home alone, and Perry is shown spending his day off watching soap operas only to be interrupted by Major Monogram, who informs him that Doofenshmirtz's mentor would visit her ex-student that day. Perry tries to ignore him, but eventually answers the call of duty. Meanwhile, the kids are viewing this exhibit called Donuts Over the Mountain, and Phineas compliments the exhibit and says that Django must have gotten his artistic talent from his father. 
Django remains unconvinced of his own talent though. He pulls out a card he made for his dad, but thinks that since everything his dad makes is so big, he wouldn't appreciate the gift. Phineas and Ferb decide to help Django recreate his card on a larger scale by painting it on the famous unpainted desert, which happens to be located next to the mountains on which Donuts Over the Mountain is displayed. Conveniently, Django's dad had made a set of working sculptures of really big art supplies, literally called really big art supplies. Agent P arrives at Doofenshmirtz's home and is in due course, trapped in a chair. Through song, Doof explains that he had always tried his best to impress his professor, Dr. Hivarwick, even though she hated him, and that today would be his last chance to leave a good impression. Once the song is over, he tells Agent P to hold on for just a moment while he goes to pay the dancers. He attempts to flirt with the lead dancer, but she walks out without a word once she has received payment. Dr. Doof, however, seems unfazed by the rejection, even used to it, as he reassures Agent P, and perhaps himself as well, that he had a shot there. Back at the museum, Phineas, Ferb, and Django finish painting Django's drawing and make it so big it covers most of a sand dune. Phineas tells Django that he ought to sign it, and Django agrees, saying that they should all sign it. When Dr. Hivarwick arrives at Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated, she criticizes Doof's posture, then has him show his latest evil inventions and projects. She at first is impressed by some of the inventions he made, which include the Deflatinator and the Drillinator, both of which appeared in the Fast and the Phineas and Candace loses her head respectively, but is quickly disappointed when she learns that none of them actually worked and that only Doofenshmirtz himself was injured in their operation. Desperate, he tells her that his blender is a blenderinator, spelling doom for even the toughest of apples. After some sarcastic comments, Dr. Hevarwa tries to leave, saying, Where is the phoninator? I need to call a cabinator. <laughs> Doof tries to impress her one more time and hurries Dr. Hevarwa over to the chair in which Agent P is trapped, insisting that he had a nemesis and is therefore evil, but Perry had reverted to his mindless domesticated animal mode, so she doesn't believe him. He protests, saying he really was his nemesis, to which she replies, In your letters, you said your nemesis was a suave, semi-aquatic personification of unstoppable dynamic fury. Doof releases Perry from the trap, insisting that he will do something, and tells Perry to thwart his plans, but he only sits there and performs his characteristic chirping purring sound, causing her to tell him that this is just sad. At the art exhibition, Candace is starting to enjoy herself. She goes to admire the view and sees the exhibit Donuts Over the Mountain. However, when she sees Phineas and Ferb's signatures on the painting made on the unpainted deserts, she reverts to her usual self and tries once more to bust them. Django is running to show his father the painting at the same time Candace is running to show the same thing to her mom. Back at Doofenshmirtz Evil Incorporated, Doof is revealing to his mentor his latest evil plan of blowing up the moon, which he claims is to honor her visiting him. Finally, Dr. Hivarwick shows him approval, stating that she has always hated moon-related songs. Yet again, Do fails since he accidentally moved the machine and it fired on a dam, and yet again, Dr. Hivarwick is disappointed, saying that she liked a good toe-tapping dam song. The water from the dam cleans the paint off the sand right before Candace can show her mom. Django hurries his dad over, only to discover his painting is gone. His dad notices the original drawing in his hand and takes it from him, saying that it's beautiful, and proceeds to put it on the giant fridge in his exhibit. Meanwhile, Doofenshmirtz is depressed over his failure, saying that all he ever wanted was to impress Dr. Hivarwick and she reassures him that evil doesn't always have to be on a big scale. You can spread evil in the little things you do every day. Heinz is touched until she angrily informs him that he can't even do that because he is a total failure and that he sickens her. Agent P walks up right after she leaves and Heinz asks Perry if he thinks he's evil. Perry gives him a reassuring grin and do thank him and that's the end of Oil on Candace. Oh Heinz. 
evil doesn't always have to be on a big scale. You can spread evil in the little things you do every day. You're right. But sadly, you can't even do that. You're a total failure. You second me, Heights, Duff, and Schmerz. Have our leg out. Wow. That could have gone better. Oh, there you are, Perry the Platypus. Oh, you, you saw that, huh? Yes, of course. You think I'm evil, right? Thank you, Perry the Platypus. Thank you. The only two cultural references in this episode are that the title alludes to the description of an oil painting, Oil on Canvas, and the unpainted desert is most likely a reference to the painted desert in Arizona. So here's some handy tools out of my really big tool shed of really big art supplies, and I forgot to mention this for the last segment, but both segments premiered as part of Disney Channel's Wiztober in 2008. The Wiz part of the name alludes to the fact that they were airing a lot of episodes from their live-action sitcom, Wizards of Waverly Place. Despite her name being in the title, Candace appears very little in this episode. Of course, the character of Django Brown is named after Jeff Swampy Marsh's son, Django Marsh. Likewise, Django's father has a similar appearance to Swampy. This was also Django's last major speaking role until the Inator method. Other than that, he was more commonly used in occasional cameos, which honestly, I wish he got more than just that. I'll explain later. Many of Dr. Doofenshmirtz's evil inventions reappear, those being the Deflatinator from The Fast and the Phineas, the Drillinator from Candace Loses Her Head, the Meltinator 65000 from Swinter, the Woodinator from Are You My Mummy, and the Ice Cream Sunday Maker from I Scream You Scream. The hat Doofenshmirtz wears during Impress My Professor is the same hat he wears while singing My Goody Two-Shoes Brother in Tree to Get Ready. Dr. Havarwick doesn't believe Perry is a secret agent when Doofenshmirtz shows him to her in mindless animal mode, yet on her way into his apartment, she walks right past Perry in Agent P mode, which is kinda confusing to me. As for her name, Havarwick means dangerous in Dutch. Perry does not go back to Phineas and Ferb at the end of the episode. Doof also says, oh there you are Perry, instead of Phineas. This episode was aired in Latin America under the title of Giant Art, or Arte Enorme in Spanish. In Spain, the title is the exact same as in the original English airing, but literally translated to Spanish as Oleo Sobre Candes. Beppo is played by Joel Grey, who is still alive today at age 91, while Dr. Hivarwick is played by Jennifer Grey, and both Joel and Jennifer are a real-life father-daughter pair of actors, each of them famous in their own right. Joel is best known for playing the Master of Ceremonies in the 1972 film Cabaret, for which he won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, while Jennifer is best known for playing the heroine Baby in 1987's Dirty Dancing. I personally know Joel Grey the best for being on The Muppet Show as a guest for season 1. Doofenshmirtz states that none of his inventions actually worked, even though they just missed their target or were thwarted by Perry before activating, etc. For unknown reasons, in Spain, Dr. Hivarwick is named Doctor instead of Doctora, which is the feminine word for it, and Doofenshmirtz says Impresionar al Maestro instead of Impresionar a la Maestra, as Maestra is the feminine word for teacher and Maestro is the masculine one. Another mistake is that Havarwick mentions that she has just come from Gimmelstein instead of Gimmelstump or Drusselstein. This episode references a line from the theme song, Painting a Continent, because the helicopters with paint rollers are similar to the ones used during the line, so you could say that Phineas and Ferb got one thing that was listed in the theme song done for this. In the art museum, the giant dragon appears but with a green color. Its first appearance was the best lazy day ever. 
There are a lot of milestones here. This is the only time the Mysterious Force gets Django instead of just Candace. The first appearance of Beppo Brown. The only episode in which Django is one of the main characters or a central part of the plot, which is too bad because I do find him to be an underrated character. It's the first time Perry smiles with his teeth shown. The fourth episode with Candace's name in the title, following life Candace action, Candace loses her head, and journey to the center of Candace. The ninth time Candace didn't reveal to Linda what the big idea was, after the Fast and the Phineas, Raging Bully, Candace loses her head, Runaway Runway, I Scream You Scream, Leave the Busting to Us, does this duck bill make me look fat? And one good scare ought to do it. The fourth time Doofenshmirtz can recognize Perry without his hat, following I scream, you scream, get that big foot out of my face, and it's about time. The fifth episode where Perry doesn't fight Doof after Get That Big Foot Out of My Face, Traffic Cam Caper, Put That Putter Away, and The Monster of Phineas and Furbenstein, the last one I talked about, and the last episode where Candace tries to get Lawrence to see the big idea as well as Linda, as all other episodes generally focus on her only getting Linda to see it. And now let's talk about what I thought about this episode. Beginning with the main part of the story, I don't know how many times I have to say this here, but I've made it no secret plenty of times before that Django Brown is a highly underrated character in my opinion. Like, as a supporting character, he's been underused, and all he's gotten for the most part are just cameos. His only real supporting appearances have been Jerk to Soleil, Grease Lightning, this episode, and the Emnator Method. And I do find it to be a shame because, personally, I do think he is an interesting character. With his artistic talent and surfing skills, I can see him working with Phineas, Ferb, Isabella, Buford, and Baljeet on their summer projects. Not to mention that Beppo and Jenny are the same thing too as underrated characters and part of his family. In fact, I would love for the revival to have an episode where Django and Jenny bond together, possibly doing something like a birthday party for Django. As for the jokes and gags, the first one I chuckled at was the one with the giant baby because Beppo didn't make the giant baby as a replica, it's a real life giant baby who gets escorted by their regular sized mother, which is an out of context moment for me. The used giant dental floss gag was slightly gross though. There is also the part where Candace desperately wants to see a giant exit sign because she feels bored and would rather be at home with Perry, followed by Linda's question regarding what Perry does when they leave him at home, which is a good spin on the Where's Perry running gag, then followed by the cheesy soap opera with characters speaking in over-the-top French accents, and then the TV has a unique transformation into a monitor for Perry's missions with Monogram. I'd like to see the giant mascara brush again. What do you say, Candace? Where's the giant exit sign? <sighs> I'd rather be at home with Perry. What do you suppose Perry does when we leave him at home? I love you, my darling. No! I love you much more than you love me. I hate you. <laughs> Sorry to bother you on your day off, Agent P. I love you! I thought you hated me! Agent P, you... Got to concentrate. It's Doofenshmirtz again. I also like the gag where Phineas shows Django the unpainted desert, which is located right next to the Donuts Over the Mountain exhibit, followed by Django showing Phineas and Ferb the shed that's literally called Really Big Art Supplies. Why don't you just paint something bigger? But where will we find a canvas big enough? Look out there, Django. Your father's display just happens to be right next to the unpainted desert. And that gives me an idea. Verb, we're gonna need some really big art supplies. Hey, we can use my dad's old exhibit. He called it Really Big Art Supplies. 
as well as a highlight of mine, which is Candace's busted, busted, busted dance, and the back and forth of Candace calling mom, 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 and Django calling dad, 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 and Doofenshmirtz calling doctor, 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 oh, I didn't mean to shout. Speaking of Doof, the Perry and Doof subplot was the big highlight of this episode. I love the song Impress My Professor and how it transforms from an acoustic ballad into a giant show tune with a female chorus. Though the one who advised me openly despised me, still I always try to be number one. Well, I wanted a mentor to share my worldview, but I got a tormentor. I was hated, it's true. Now I have one more chance, and it could mean my advancement. So there's only one thing I must do. I must impress my professor. He's got to be good. I must impress my professor. He's misunderstood. And also liked at the end when Doof tries to flirt with one of the dancers by giving her a check and possibly asking her out on a date before she leaves and he says, I think I got a shot there, which is a solid adult innuendo. And Dr. Havarwick was kind of funny and well written as a character too. She has a lot of charisma and is not too overly wacky for the type of character she is. I love when Doof calls his blender a blenderinator and describes it as spelling doom for even the toughest of apples with his Granny Smith apples. And what's even more funny is Dr. Havarwick's sarcastic response, I'm sure if I was a pomacious fruit, I would be trembling. Where is your phoneinator? I need to call a cabinator. I also found it absolutely hilarious when Doof shows Perry to Dr. Havarwick, only to discover that Perry is in his mindless domestic pet state, as well as the whole scene where Doof accidentally fires his one-time ray machine at the dam instead of at the moon, with all that talk about moon-related songs and dam-related songs, and the fact that the innator can only fire once. To honor your visit, I will blow up the moon! Blow up the moon? But that would mean... Yes! No more stupid songs about the moons! I do despise moon-related songs. Continue. It takes a lot of power, so I can only fire it once, but don't worry. I have it planned until the last... Ow! Oops! <laughs> no more songs about dams? Oh, but I like a good toe-tapping dam song. And for both sides, the ending was kind of sweet and heartfelt. For the main plot, it really is nice to know that even if Django's original art is small compared to Beppo's and the larger version on the unpainted desert was washed away, he'll always be a real artist, and it really shows how Beppo is a good father to Django. Okay, Dad, this way. It's time for your big sur- Prize? But, um... What you got there, Django? Well, I made this for you, but it's kind of small. Compared to what you do, it's not real art. It's beautiful, son. You are a real artist. Really? With your permission, there's a very special place I'd like to put this. Come on, bud. Wow, there's no higher place of honor than the fridge. Especially a giant fridge. Though part of me doesn't really know all of why Candace needed to bust Phineas and Ferb just for painting a large-scale version of Django's artwork on the unpainted desert, because it wasn't as dangerous even despite the use of giant art supplies and vehicles. I mean, in real life, kids wouldn't be allowed to drive any actual vehicle since they don't know how and don't have a license, so that could be one reason. And for the subplot, I really felt sorry for Doofenshmirtz as he wanted to impress Dr. Havarwick, but because Perry destroyed some of the innators or Doof wasn't careful enough when demonstrating them, and because Perry wasn't a secret agent in Havarwick's presence, she blasted Doof for being a failure, and it really was sweet when Perry complimented him that the latter is evil. The animation once again is done by Rough Draft Korea, and for this one, it does look good for the majority of it. Like the last segment, I saw some solid movements and gestures, and good shading and lighting, especially on the hills. The backgrounds are artistic, and I love the giant replicas that Beppo makes. It really makes guests feel like they're part of Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but in a museum instead of a suburban household and backyard. It has 
these good looking effects such as water, paint, the shine on the donuts, smears, and brush strokes for rapid movements, and the facial hair that Perry grows when he's watching a soap opera. I can also give credit to Dr. Havarlik's character design as a small cartoony plump woman with glasses, plus I also love her walking animation, which is kinda similar to a Hanna-Barbera character like Fred Flintstone when he's revving up the Flintmobile. My favorite part of the visuals, however, is everything that Phineas, Ferb, and Django do to the desert, from the trampoline onto the tubes, to the paint hose, to the helicopters with paint rollers from the opening, to the crane with a giant paintbrush, to the paint balloon catapult, to the paintbrush surfing, it really is that creative. But there are some more flaws with it than I had last time. When Django says, I don't know Phineas, his mouth glitches and overlaps some frames for a second. After Doofenshmirtz shows Hivarlik the blender, she can be seen with four eyebrows which didn't necessarily ruin that one joke, but it could have been fixed. And sometimes the mouth can get choppy, like on the second time Candace says mom when she runs off, her mouth doesn't move. Plus when Candace says but, but, but. Her mouth doesn't sync up as it closes when she says it. I guess it is possible her mouth movement was reversed. And at the end of the episode, when Dr. Hivarwick said Hivarwick out, she went the wrong way when the door was on the right and she walked to the left where the balcony is. That way she would have fallen off or maybe she found a hidden exit. Some errors I spied in the visuals include that the tour guy's mouth disappears for one frame, as she says, as Django can tell you, during the song Impress My Professor, Perry's feet are briefly teal instead of orange, and before the painting on the desert is washed away, the sun on it is not there. For my final thoughts on this episode, it's not perfect, but it is still a highly enjoyable one, and it made me want another main appearance from Django since the show is coming back. Now last but not least are the credit sequences, or just one credit sequence even, because on standalone broadcasts, the monster of Phineas and Furbenstein uses the same one due to a lack of a unique credit sequence for it, both segments use a repeat of the last verse of Impress My Professor from Oil on Candace. And that's all I need to say about the credits right now because there's nothing else to it. And now, it's time to end things off with our roller coaster rating. So I give the Monster of Phineas and Furbenstein 9 Platypus Monster themed roller coasters out of 10 for how hilarious it is, in addition to being a well written parody of monster movies, and I give Oil on Candace 8.5 giant roller coasters full of really big art supplies out of 10, while it does have a few issues with the animation, I do like the writing for both sides of the story, with the Perry and Doofenshmirtz bit being the highlight, and with Django's role in here, it made me wish he was a main character alongside the other kids, plus the ending was heartfelt. So finally, I give this episode 9 roller coasters out of 10, and both segments are worth watching whether it's Halloween or not. They really do make a good Phineas and Ferb episode. So now let's get to the poll results of the very first Tumblr poll. Take it away, reporter. Happy Halloween, listeners! I am Count Reportula, and I want to suck your blood, blah blah blah! Now, get ready for something that's not as spooky as what I just said to do, which I didn't really mean, and that is the result of the first ever Tumblr poll. We asked our listeners, in honor of the Phineas and Ferb revival, what merchandise would you like to see in retail stores? The choices were... A. A complete DVD or Blu-ray set B. Funko Pops Or C. Both 
10.4% want Funko Pops of the characters. 20.7% want both a complete physical box set and some Funko Pops. But 68.9% want a complete physical box set on DVD and Blu-ray the most, containing all four seasons of the original run, with both movies, Candace Against the Universe having its first physical release, and all the take two with Phineas and Ferb shorts. So hopefully we'll see that come out sometime in the future, particularly in 2024. There were 164 votes in total. And now back to Caleb for his pick and a brand new Tumblr poo. This is Count Reportula flying out. I mean, signing out. Blah, blah, blah. I do not say blah, blah, blah. Thanks, Count Reportula, or whatever vampire name you decide to call yourself. Nice vampire costume, by the way, even though none of my listeners can see it. <laughs> and I'm already wearing my signature soldier uniform for Halloween. <laughs> But anyways, I would like to see some Funko Pop figures, but for my pick, it's no contest. I would love most to see a complete DVD and Blu-ray set. Not only because digital downloads and streaming on Disney Plus are the only ways to watch the entire show in widescreen, not counting the TV broadcasts, but also because physical media needs more support than ever in this day and age, the Candace Against the Universe movie has yet to have an official physical release, especially now that Disney has decided to put more of their Disney Plus exclusive titles on Blu-ray, and the rest of the Take 2 shorts were never released on physical media before, only 6 of them were released as bonus features on the Animal Agents DVD, which are the ones with Cedric the Entertainer, David Beckham, Jason Siegel, Sean White, Miss Piggy, and Ben Stiller. So I would love to have the whole original show, both movies, and all 20 Take 2 with Phineas and Ferb shorts in my hands, along with some bonus features from the compilation DVDs, like the original pitch, all in time for the revival, and I think I'd like to call it Phineas and Ferb, The Ultimate Collection. Disney has already seen success in self-releasing the entirety of the original DuckTales, Tailspin, The Weekenders, and the original Proud Family on DVD, as well as releasing the entire original Chippendale Rescue Rangers and the Tangled series on Blu-ray, and they also lent Gravity Falls to Shout Factory at one point for a complete DVD and Blu-ray release, so why not Phineas and Ferb now that it's coming back? Just one simple request. But now let's start a new Tumblr poll, and because it's Halloween, I'm going to ask my listeners, which of these three Dwampyverse Halloween episodes is your favorite? And for my picks, I've got A. One Good Scare Ought to Do It from Phineas and Ferb B. Milo Murphy's Halloween Screamatorium from Milo Murphy's Law or C. The Night Marionette from Hamster and Gretel and yes, I'm counting the latter because it was advertised as a Halloween episode for last year's Calling All the Monsters on Disney Channel. So those are three different Halloween episodes from three different shows right there. Go ahead and go to Tumblr and search for at Caleb Dirksen 2 or hashtag Danville Discussion Poll, which is all spaced out, so you should be able to find it. Go right over there and make your voice heard. Before I wrap this episode up, however, I have to go through yet some more Danville Discussion news updates. The first piece of news that I have is some news on the Phineas and Ferb revival from New York Comic Con. Now, some of you may have heard that Dan Povemeyer and Jeff Swampy Marsh have attended New York Comic Con recently, and news sources were learning more about Season 5, the merchandise, the famous Dr. Doofenshmirtz voice, and more. And here on my source from the Pop Insider, it's giving me more of an idea of what to expect. And if those TikToks prove me anything from the last bonus news episode, according to Dan, it is in fact a continuation of the show, in which he says about the time setting, 
It'll probably be the following summer. It's basically the same show as before. We've got a lot of the same staff. And Swampy adds, We realized we hadn't run out of ideas yet. So it is going to be set one year later during the next summer. And honestly, that's probably the best route to go for this revival. I mean, I wouldn't be against the idea of seeing the characters in school, but I wouldn't really want to be all set completely during the Actor Age timeline because that episode wasn't really the best. It's for the best that they set it to the next summer because Phineas and Ferb are the personification of summer. Next, it says basically, nothing will be built from scratch. Instead, your favorite animated stepbrothers will continue building in the backyard, and your favorite scientist will continue inventing in his attempt to take over the world. Or the tri-state area, you mean. So basically, it sounds like Doofenshmirtz will be returning to his usual evil shtick to take over the tri-state area, and honestly... I will say that it would be insulting if they retcon any good deeds that Doof did in Last Day of Summer and Milo Murphy's Law, which I do worry the latter might be retconned for this. But on the other hand, I don't see them having any other choice. Like, they're aiming to introduce Phineas and Ferb to a new generation, and if you want to do something like that, you have to make Doofenshmirtz evil again. And I'll probably understand it, because Dan made it clear that Doof had a relapse in Phineas and Ferb's Christmas Vacation. In other words, that episode might be set between the original and the revival. So, I'm willing to accept that if it's true, despite it being a stretch. But, on TikTok, I found a comment from a fan asking, Will the new episodes be with a good Doofenshmirtz from Milo Murphy's Law? I love that show also. And Swampy responded, Tune in to find out. No spoilers. So it can be implied that Doof could be either good or evil in these new seasons, and if he is good, Doof's traps for Perry could just be a prank. And the same goes for Candace, because you have to have her back to her busting mode, which I have a feeling will happen even after Candace Against the Universe and Last Day of Summer. The way I see it, she'll still try and bust her brothers after the former movie, but not as obsessively this time. But yeah, I like the direction they're going with the setting, even though I'm unsure of how Doof and Candace will be handled, but I'm sure the other characters will be handled well. On top of that, the first batch of Season 5 episodes have revealed their titles on the internet, all sourced from the Entertainment Identifier Registry, with a placeholder date of 2023, since they still have yet to air in 2024, and here they are. Episode 1, Summer Blockbuster, and Cloudy with a Chance of Mom. Episode 2, Appetite for Adventure, and License to Bust. Episode 3, Dry Another Day, and Deconstructing Doof. Episode 4, Tropy McTropeface and Biblio Blast. Episode 5, A Chip to the Vet and More Than an Intern. Episode 6, The Aurora Perialis and Lord of the Firesides. Episode 7, Agent T-14 and the Haberdasher. And finally, Episode 8, and the first segment says to be announced, but the other segment paired with it is called Out of Character. Now, about Lord of the Firesides, that's telling me that it could be another episode centered on the Fireside Girls following Isabella and the Temple of Sap, Bee Story, and Operation Crumb Cake, which I feel is a good thing, even if I think Isabella and the Temple of Sap is probably the best one. Plus, I hope to see another subplot with Pinky the Chihuahua fighting against Poofin plots. Next, regarding Agent T-14, I really hope it's a Stacy and Perry-centered episode, considering the subplot where Stacy discovers Perry's secret agent identity at one point in one of the later episodes, Happy Birthday Isabella. 
And finally, I wonder what episode number Meep Me in St. Louis will be for season 5 or 6, because that hasn't been shown yet and it is confirmed to be part of the revival. I don't think it's gonna be the to be announced episode to be paired with Out of Character, because the other two Chronicles of Meep episodes are half hour episodes. With that said, if Candace Against the Universe proved me anything, it's that I will remain positive that even if these revival seasons come with some issues, that Dan and Swampy can still deliver on the same quality of writing that the show has always had. So I do see this revival being still good, and we shall continue to wait until the next year, 2024, to see more of what the new seasons will be like. Second, we're near the end of Hamster and Gretel Season 1, and next month, in November, we've got two new episodes airing before the penultimate, airing the first two Saturdays of November at 10am Eastern Pacific on Disney Channel. From my source here on DGE Press, I have the episode titles and synopsis, so get ready people, here they are. On Saturday, November 4th, they'll be airing Shush Hour. Gretel does a school project on herself while Kevin and Hamster stop a librarian villain. I was a teenage mad scientist. Professor Exclamation attends his high school reunion. And then on Saturday, November 11th, we've got Too Many Crooks. Gretel encounters a villain who can multiply herself. President Fred. Fred runs for student body president. So, as always, if you watch Hamster and Gretel, tune into Disney Channel both Saturdays at 10 a.m. Eastern Pacific to check out those new episodes or set a DVR recording. And that's pretty much it. And speaking of which, that is all that I've got to talk about this week, so thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Danville Discussion. As for me, you can find me on my Facebook page at Real Caleb Dirksen, on my Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok pages at Caleb Dirksen 2 with the number 2 at the end and all in lowercase, on my alternate Twitter page at Caleb the PNF Guy, on my Instagram pages at Caleb.Dirksen for my main page or at Caleb Flynn Fletcher for my alternate page, on Threads at Caleb.Dirksen, on DeviantArt at CalebDirksen20, and on Blue Sky Social at CalebDirksen2.BSky.Social, where I'll send you an invite code on any other social site to let you in. You can also find me on Discord by entering the username Caleb Dirksen, all in one word and all in lowercase. And if you go to the invite link in the description below, it'll also invite you to my Discord server so that you can talk with me about anything, including this podcast or my other content. You can also find me on YouTube, just search for Caleb Dirksen and look for the icon of me as a soldier. And if you want to support my work and get some great rewards all at once for even the bare minimum of $2 a month, which includes getting access to my content before or anyone else, including my videos, my podcast episodes, and everything like that, then you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Caleb Dirksen. Special thanks to everyone who has followed or supported me on Patreon, including Kalela Shaw, Sue Friend, Brock Clifton Friend, and my guest patron, Gilbert Gann. It really means a lot to me. As for this podcast, we are available to listen on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Good Pods, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio at www.iheart.com slash podcast slash 9971060707. And you can also find us on Spotify for Podcasters by using your Apple or Android device or going on the web at anchor.fm slash Caleb Dirksen. It'll take you directly to the Danville Discussion page on Anchor part of Spotify for podcasters. If you've listened to this episode on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast service and you like what you just heard, do you mind doing us a favor and please subscribe, leave a review, and give us five stars if you enjoy this? That would really help us get discovered by the public. And if you were listening to this podcast as a video on YouTube, then press that like button on the video and leave us a little comment with your thoughts on this episode of Phineas and Ferb. You can also share your feedback or ask some questions by sending us 
an email at danvildiscussion at gmail.com with the series and episode title in the subject line. Join us next time, and I'll be doing a special episode where I'm going to get into the Chibiverse once again to review Episode 5, or Season 2, Episode 1, The Chibi Quiz Challenge, which has two new exclusive Chibi Tiny Tail shorts of the Dwapiverse. Tune in next time for the newest episode of the Danville Discussion with all things related to Phineas and Ferb and beyond, and with that said, thank you guys so much for listening, have a happy Halloween, enjoy your trick-or-treating, and until next time, this is Caleb, over and out. This podcast was created strictly and only for entertainment and information purposes. It is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company, Disney Television Animation, or their affiliates. All and any names, images, clips, sounds, or other items related to Phineas and Ferb, Milo Murphy's Law, Hamster and Gretel, and other Disney properties are trademarks and or copyrights of their respective holders. All original content from this podcast is the intellectual property of the Danville Discussion and the host or hosts running the podcast unless otherwise noted. Mom! 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 Dad! 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 Doctor! 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 Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to shout. (laughs) 